this evening I'd like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, quite an important topic and that topic is how to become a stream enterer. Right. So those of you who know a little bit about Buddhist uh, Soteriology, Soteriology, Buddhist, any Buddhist stuff. <laughs> no, no, of course, we talk about enlightenment all the time, right? So that's what we practice. The Buddha means enlighten, enlightened, literally awakened, yeah, rather than enlightened, but it's a semantic point. But So we are on the path to enlightenment, on the path to awakening. And one of the tenets of Buddhism is that that, that um, realization of awakening doesn't just happen. Okay? It's not random. And it doesn't happen all at once. It, okay? So it, doesn't ha just, it, it happens according to causes and conditions. It happens to co for a reason. It's not just a random event. Okay, and those, the Buddha talked about those causes and conditions very often, and so it's not, um, and it's not something which which necessarily happens all at once. So usually the Buddha distinguished between four stages, okay, four classes of an awakened being, and um, those are mentioned in the the evening chanting that we do. We say we we pay homage to the noble sangha, the Arya sangha who are the four kinds of persons, okay? Uh, and it actually says the eight kinds of person, the four pairs and the eight kinds of persons. So what that means is that there are four, basically four stages of awakening, but each of those four stages is subdivided, and they're subdivided into what we usually call the path and the fruit, okay? That means one who's on their way and the one who's actually there, all right? So it's two, heart, two aspects of the same thing, so that's how you get eight. But there's really four stages. Now, the first stage of those is what we call stream entry. And of course, then that's very important. And stream entry has a great significance in Buddhism. And the great significance of it is, the main significance is that you are uh, destined for full awakening. Okay? So once you're a stream enterer, basically you can relax. Okay? You can chill out. Take it easy, and uh, drink some clarets and whatever you give up your job. Well, I'm not suggesting you should do all those things. And in fact, the Buddha didn't. The Buddha, interestingly enough, one place he said that he didn't talk about these things too much, precisely for that reason. He didn't want people to be negligent. So uh, it is possible for a stream enterer to be negligent, but they shouldn't be. So, but, you know, you may, maybe you'll be faster or slow. Once you get to stream entry, you might get to enlightenment faster or slow, but you're going to get there eventually, and you're freed from any kind of very painful rebirth, okay? And so, you know, the, the, to, just to remember like that kind of the way, it's very difficult for us to appreciate the weight of the karma that, that's, that we're dragging around. And the Buddha used all of these very, very powerful similes, and he said, you know, just like you would take up seven little bits of dirt, seven little stones, little pebbles in his hand. And he'd say, which is greater, Mike, these seven little pebbles or the mighty Himalayas? Yeah. So the monks say, well, the, the, the mighty Himalayas are vast, are huge, immeasurable. Yeah. These seven little pebbles are just tiny. And the Buddha said, well, the, just this much is how much suffering is left for a stream enterer. And that mighty Himalayas is the amount of suffering that they've let go of. Okay. So that's considerable. Yeah. Uh, another simile the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddha was pretty good with similes, you've got to admit. One of the similes he used is if he said that, now, if I see if I get this right, if they were going to come up to you and say, I'm going to take you, throw you into jail, chain you up, and stab you with a spear a hundred times in the morning, and then I'm going to stab you with a spear a hundred times at noon and a hundred times at night, all right? And I'm going to keep on doing that day after day for a hundred years, Yeah? And at the end of that time, you can get stream entry. 
He said, if somebody offers you that deal, you should take it. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's how much suffering you get rid of. Yeah? So we're not offering that deal, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that that's just the point that the Buddha made. But also made the point that it's interesting. There's this kind of ambivalence in the, the, the suttas about how easy it is to get stream entry. On the one hand, one sutta, the Buddha says, if these trees outside knew what was, what was right and what was wrong, I would declare them to be stream enterers. Right? Another time he talked about it with, the, with uh, Ananda, and uh, Ananda said, was watching the Vajians, the princes of the Lichavis, who were practicing archery. And they would have a, like an, a target a long way away and they would shoot the arrow into the target. Okay? But they were so good at archery, they would then shoot the next arrow to come along and split the first arrow. Yeah? That was how good they were at, at archery. And, and Ananda went to the Buddha and said, wow, these Lichavis are pretty good at archery. And, and the Buddha said, well, because they can split the arrow from behind. And the Buddha said, well, which is easier, to, 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 to do that and split the arrow or to, to split a hair that's 100 metres away with an arrow? And Ananda said, oh, splitting a hair would be much more difficult. And the Buddha said, well, becoming a stream enter is harder than that. So, we've got to practice, yeah? <laughs> got to practice. So, what does being a stream enter mean? What, is it, what, 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 are they, what have they done? Well, what they've done is they've seen the Four Noble Truths. That's the essence of it. You've seen the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, the path leading to the ending of suffering. You've actually realized them in yourself. It's not just an idea, not just a theory. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a salvific knowledge. It's a knowledge which actually undoes the knots that bind us to suffering. It's not undone completely, but it, they're partially undone. And particularly the knots that are undone, the most important one is the, the knot of the idea of a self, the, the, the view of a self. Okay? And this is why the, the stream enterer has let go of so much suffering. So it's very important to understand this point. Why is there just seven pebbles left and the mighty Himalayas of suffering have disappeared? Yeah? This is why. Because the view of self is gone. Right? It's the view of self which goes out and brings that suffering into our lives. It's because we identify with those acts, with that karma. Yeah? That's why we go and get that suffering. The suffering itself has no power it has no any it only is activated because we go and get it and we drag the suffering into our lives we say this is mine we cling on to the suffering and we drag that into our lives it's mine that's why we suffer yeah? and you all know that you've all seen that yeah you've seen that today <laughs> in your work haven't you or wherever you've been someone's done something, you don't like it, you go away, you think about it. You know, if you were able to not think about it, they said that to me. If there's no identification that they said that to me, you let go of it, you go out of that situation, the suffering's left behind. Yeah? It's only because you think about it, because of your idea of a self, you go out and say, that suffering is mine. And you go and you grab it, and you, say, ah! and you bring it in, and you start beating yourself over the head with it. That's why we suffer, yeah? And so that's why the stream enterer has let go so much of that suffering. Okay? Still not complete enlightenment, okay? But pretty good. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the path to stream entry. What does a path to stream entry mean and, and how do we actually develop it? What are the important qualities to develop? Well, in one sense, obviously... It's the Eightfold Path, okay? So the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Buddha says explicitly that the stream enterer has developed the Noble Eightfold Path, okay? Uh, not fully, but they've, they've, they have each of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, uh, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi. All of those factors are present, okay? 
and you can't you can't sort of skip over any, you can't miss out on any. But even though all of those practices are, are present, or another way of putting it, because they, they, they've they've done the threefold training: uh, the 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 sila, the the uh, ethics, samadhi is the the practice of concentration, meditation, and wisdom, uh, seeing of the nature of impermanence and not self, and so on. So that each of those things that they have. And that's a very general way of putting it. But there's also many places where the Buddha talked about the attainment of stream entry in more specific ways. And, and by looking at and, and reviewing those sutta passages, then you gain a certain impression for the things that are really important, uh, things which are mentioned again and again and again as being factors that are important for stream entry. Um, now, one of those factors is faith. Yeah? That's mentioned again and again and again for stream entry is the faith. It's not a quality which is necessarily emphasized all that much in, in modernist Buddhism. We always say Buddhism is a religion of reason and so on. But there's actually two kinds or two personalities to attain stream entry. One emphasizes faith more, one emphasizes uh, wisdom more or reason. Yeah? So these two kinds. Uh, but in, in any case, both of them need faith. Okay, So... What is that faith? Of course, faith in Buddhism is always expressed as faith in the triple gem. Okay? So we have this object of, of devotion. And uh, when we look at Buddhist cultures all around the world, then this is something which they have really taken up. And Buddhist, Buddhist cultures all have a very beautiful devotional aspect to them uh, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a sense of honoring the triple gem. And so, you know, the, as we, we think or reflect about the Buddha Dharma Sangha, this is something we should uh, reflect in how, how it is significant for us. You know, the, the Buddha as the one who discovers the truth. Yeah? The person who discovered it, the Dhamma is his teaching, the Sangha is those who followed the way and realized the same truth. And that those three things can be understood in many different ways. And from you know, we can understand it in a very literal sense. You, the Buddha is the historical personage, this personage, Siddhartha Gautama. He's born in in India about 500 BC, in the, the son of the the uh, Sakyan family in Kapilavattu. Mother was called Maya. The father was called Suddhodana. He was brought up as a young man. At age of uh, 29, he left home practiced for six years in the wilderness, rejected the practice of his former teachers, and then by himself realized the path to awakening, became awakened at the age of 35 in Bodhgaya, under the Bodhi tree, and uh, subsequently spent 45 years of his life traveling around India, set up, established the Sangha of Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis, converted many lay disciples, and then passed away at the age of 80 uh, underneath the twin sal trees in Kusinara. So that's, that's the life of the Buddha and the Buddha as a historical person. Yeah? And for many, this is, including myself, then this is a very moving and very important devotional aspect. I, I personally find a tremendous um, uh, significance for me in, in the historical reality of Siddhartha Gautama. And, uh, you know, I've found so much joy and wonder in, in traveling to India and to seeing the holy sites, seeing the places where the Buddha lived, where he stepped, oh, okay, this is the vulture's peak, this is what the Buddha would have seen. Yeah, this is Bodhgaya, this is where he became enlightened, you know, and to come and, and to pay uh, homage at the Bodhi tree was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, you know, a bit embarrassing because we would be a big group of people and you go there and bowing down, I've got kind of tears running down my eyes. And uh, it's all kind of a bit embarrassing for an Aussie bloke to be crying in public, but <laughs> I managed to <laughs> manage to deal with it. And uh, so that's that's something which, for me, is I find personally, and of course, I also find personally a lot of devotion to the Dhamma. And uh, as many of you know, I, I, I have a, a tremendous love for the for the suttas, for the teachings that the Buddha taught. And I find in them a directness and a, and a reality and a, um, an urgency and a vividness 
that speaks to me of, 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 of a genuine spiritual realization. Uh, and even though these days I spend a lot of my time doing textual criticism and deconstruction of the texts and showing how there's redaction processes and the different voices can be heard within them and all of these things. But nevertheless, these are qualifications to the main thing. And the main thing is that, that, that directness of voice which... I can hear through the Buddhist suttas, you know, and it's, it's in common with, with other things. You know, you can hear a similar thing. For me, I can hear a similar thing in the Gospels or in some of the Upanishads and so on. And you hear uh, a direct and straight voice of spiritual authority. There's something about the confidence uh, and the, the simplicity, the directness of the, of the sense of spiritual authority, which for me is very moving in, in reading the Dhamma, reading the suttas that Buddha taught. And, of course, the Sangha. And the Sangha is twofold, as the conventional Sangha is the, the monastic community of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and then the, the Sangha in the ultimate sense is the Sangha of awakened disciples, yeah? all those who are on the path. And of course, in, in modern times, the modern usage of Sangha has been, come to mean a spiritual community in general. Yeah? So in each case, we can see that that's something which is uh, supportive of our, 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 our spiritual practice. Yeah? And so this act of, act of devotion is very beautiful. So the problem with devotion, and, and um, you know, we can see that very, very often in, in traditional Buddhist cultures, is that uh, while in itself it's very beautiful, it becomes the whole thing. Yeah? It's not just a part, it's not just the start of our practice, the foundation of our practice, it becomes the whole of our practice. And rather than the devotion to the Buddha and Dhamma Sangha being a spur for us to actually practice them and study them, and you know, we should, we should be listening to what the Buddha said, practicing what the Buddha said, becoming one of the Sangha, that should be our aims. But instead we externalize those things. The, 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 Buddha, Dhamma, the Buddha is the, the image on the shrine that we bow down to. The Dhamma is the books in the Tripitaka case, which we, we worship and we don't ever read. Yeah, the Sangha is the, the monks over there. We can bat all the monks and they can keep our precepts for us. <laughs> so, 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 so. Yeah. <laughs> so, different kind of justifications. I don't have to keep precepts. The monks will keep the precepts for me. The, the monks, what the monks can say instead is they can say, well, look, you know, really, I've actually I've got 227 precepts. So, if I lose a couple, it doesn't matter too much. But you've only got five. So, you've got to be really careful. Yeah. <laughs> So there are different ways of thinking about it. So, you know, in a sense, faith requires, like, a, a, a thou. This is the word they use in Christian theology, the sense of thou, I, I and thou. Like a sense of, of, of submission to something which is higher and deeper and more wonderful than I have experienced in myself. And even the Buddha himself said he needed this. It's very beautiful. After his enlightenment, he's enlightened and he said, Who, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not, I won't be happy unless I live honoring and worshipping, unless I have the ability to pay devotion. What should I pay devotion to? Here I am. I'm, I'm awakened. I'm enlightened. Who else do I pay devotion to? I know I'll pay devotion to the Dhamma. Yeah? So the Buddha said, I'll live worshipping and devote my life devoted to the Dhamma because that's the highest thing of all. Yeah? So this is very beautiful to say that aspect of devotion. It calls up an aspect of our mind, right? an aspect of our heart, an emotional engagement with uh, the practice. Yeah? It brings it into it brings it into life. So that quality of faith is very very important. Another quality which is mentioned as as being highly characteristic of the stream enterer is it mentions the, the sila, is the keeping of the precepts, and always phrased in terms of keeping the five precepts. Yeah? So not to kill, not to steal, uh, not to uh, commit adultery, not to uh, lie, and not to uh, drink or take intoxicants or drugs. And so these five precepts, of course, are the, always been regarded as the foundation of the ethical life for Buddhists. And of course it's important to remember, I mean, those five precepts are very challenging, yeah? And they're, they're, they're challenging in different ways for different people, yeah? 
for some people the, the precept about not drinking is is means nothing you know they're not in a, in a place where they feel like they want to drink or anything like that you know some in some environments it's very interesting how environment changes these things so for example you know as you know I used to be a musician you know so when you're a muso you know you're drinking every day you don't think about it I mean I was never an alcoholic or anything like that but you know you're always having a couple of beers or something when I went to Thailand I almost just completely stopped without even thinking about it you know partly because it was too expensive and but it was just in a different environment, you know. And so my whole like year as a layman in Thailand, you know, I only had you know, one or two beers or something like that. There was hardly anything, without any intention on my part. I wasn't trying to do that. That was just how it worked out. So these things are very contextual. Uh, and another one, for example, not killing. You know, for for us, you know, living in living in a kind of urban environment in Australia, not killing is maybe a, a bit awkward a bit inconvenient you know we've got a mosquito or some ants or how do you get rid of the cockroaches from the kitchen cupboard or something like that but if you're living in a in a village where you survive by fishing right then this precept becomes very very difficult yeah how do you how do you keep that yeah? so it's very contextual uh, uh, but in any case we should be very familiar with these five precepts and we should try to keep them as best we can and always remember the important thing about Buddhist precepts is that there's no thou shalt or thou shalt not, right? So nobody's standing over you. Maybe they should. Maybe it would be better if they did. But it, you see, it doesn't actually seem to work all that well, does it? You know, actually, have someone standing over your shoulder and say, thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do that. It's a fairly immature way to relate to, to ethics. Yeah? And you know, it's, it's what you say to kids. Right, so be careful, right? thou shalt. <laughs> yeah, because you have to. You say, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Right? But then when you've grown up, we take a grown-up ethical precept. Yeah? So we don't, it's not thou shalt or thou shalt not. It's I undertake the training. Sikhapadang samadhyami. I undertake the training. And so that's a mature act. It's a responsible act. Yeah? We're doing it because we, we want to do it. And it's our responsibility to do it. You know, it's, it's like the difference between, say, going to primary school, where you, you know, your parents send you to primary school and you have to go. Yeah? And, then if, and then the difference where if you're taking up a, a post-grad degree, you, know, you, you, you decide, I'm going to do this study. And at primary school, the teacher's always on your back saying, make sure you do it. When you do your post-grad work or you do your doctorate or whatever, no one's chasing you up all the time. You're responsible. You've decided to do it. It's up to you to get the work done. Yeah? So that's how we should approach our ethical life. Yeah? It's not a matter of being forced to do something. It's a matter of recognizing that this is beneficial. And so all of those five precepts, I think we can all recognize that they're all beneficial and that they all lead to happiness. Yeah? Not killing it leads to happiness. We were talking about that earlier, that, that uh, you know, the act of killing not only harms the other, but is, is deeply wounding to our own psyche. You know, there's something in the human mind which which just does not like to hurt or to harm. And even if we can marginalize that and ignore that in the case of beings who we regard as, as not important, but still there's something in us which knows that that being feels pain and there's something in us that doesn't want to hurt. And we know that stealing is harmful, harmful to the person we're stealing from. And, you know, what do you feel like if you steal something? You know, you feel guilty, you feel scared and all of these kinds of things. Yeah? Committing adultery. Yeah, it causes so much pain, yeah? So much pain and so much turmoil in people's lives, yeah? And uh, so much stress. So it's just it's a, it's just a question of, of uh, like restraint and care so that, that our, our sexual relations should be based on love and they should be based on respect, yeah? And, uh, and, that, and remember in Buddhism we don't have the idea that you find in Christianity where marriage has to be once and forever. Okay? So in Christianity, maybe you have an excuse. Well, you can't get a divorce because it's illegal to get a divorce. You know, I mean, that doesn't apply these days, but maybe traditionally it did. In Buddhism, that's not the case. In Buddhism, you enter into a relationship, and of course it's good to sustain that relationship, and if you can do that for the rest of your life, then that's fantastic. But there's no prescription against separation or divorce if that's what's necessary. Okay? So if you've fallen out of love and you're not finding the satisfaction with that person, then that's okay yeah? to try to separate as best you can and then uh, get on with your life. 
So uh, Musavada is a false speech. And of course, you know, by false speech, you know, the very purpose of all Buddhist practice is to realize awakening is wisdom. Yeah? And so bodhi, awakening, is exactly the opposite of musa or moha, yeah? is the delusion. So in, in speaking falsely, we're creating delusion in others and creating the karmic effects for creating more delusion for ourselves. Uh, interestingly enough, I had this, I was in Adelaide a, a, couple, a few days ago, I had this chat with this uh, Aboriginal elder, uncle, what they call Uncle Lewis, and uh, he was very interesting to talk to and he had some, some very nice things to talk about how they, would, they were doing the, the teaching and the training for people in his, his, in his, within his people and for the young people. And uh, he's saying that they would, um, the, young, the young people had to, had to watch and learn what the elders did and they weren't allowed to ask questions right? because that made it too easy. Right? So they had to sort of be able, have to had to learn to work at things out for themselves, and he's saying that part of the culture was that that that, that from time to time they'd lie to people, right? and he's saying this is one thing that the western that the westerns and the anthropologists didn't get, because they were confused about why that why the people were lying. But they said that they they only lie to them because they they want to stop you from being complacent. So if you're teaching someone. Yeah, and they always then they, they think they can always get an answer from you. You always tell them the answer. Yeah, then you always get complacent. You never learn to find anything out from yourself. Yeah, but then if you learn, oh, actually the answer is wrong, or I can't get, then you have to work out how do I know which one's right and which one's wrong. Yeah, so you have to do it. So this I thought was a very interesting approach. You know, even though uh, you know they, they they would tell a fib, but they're doing it with the intention to to promote learning or something like that. The Buddha wouldn't do it quite like that. He, he wouldn't lie, but he would do a similar thing in terms of he would give like enigmatic statements, yeah, or things which were not readily understandable, and then people would go, "What does that mean? What's he on about?" and, and, and discussing. So again, promoting the, the inquiry. Not lying, and uh, last one is not drinking and taking intoxicants. So, uh, if we want to uh, develop mindfulness, hmm, presumably then, of course, you know, taking alcohol acts directly against mindfulness. And, of course, you know, there's, a, there's a vast spectrum here. There's someone who has a, a glass of wine occasionally after work or something is one thing, and then you know, the alcoholic who destroys their life with drink is another thing. And so we have to relate to this with maturity and care. But you know, don't kid yourself. Yeah? Um, you know, I remember one time when I was in Perth and, and uh, was, uh, some friends of ours had organized or part of organizing for the festival uh, this choir of singers from Africa. I can't remember which African country they were coming. They were all there and we, we had a dinner with them and a party and so on. We were talking and they were saying how ridiculous it is that in Australia you have all these drink driving rules. They're saying, you know, we drive better when we're drunk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, yeah, and then you look at the road fatality figures in Africa and you start to think, oh. <laughs> so don't delude yourself, yeah? Why are the drink driving rules so strict? Why do they say, you know, you can only have, how many is it now? Two or three drinks or something that you can have before driving, yeah? Because even that much is starting to actually affect your mindfulness and your reaction time, the clarity of your mind. That's why those rules are there, yeah? And uh, if, if, if it's so bad that it's affecting even our ability to do something fairly uh, course like driving, how much more so is it affecting the subtle a a aspects of our mind and our consciousness? Yeah, and so out of respect for the work we're doing, the effort we're doing in Buddhism, we should we should out of respect for that should understand. Well, you know, let's not undo the good work that we've done. Okay, through through uh, you know destroying our brain cells and all of those kinds of things. So this is the five precepts, and. That's only the beginning, of course. Five precepts is never meant to be and should not be taken as being a complete description of our ethical life, by no means. It's only a few tips on important things, nothing more than that. And there's so much more to living a good ethical life. Yeah, and We can, we can talk about that many other occasions. But just one thing I, I would just mention is that when the Buddha was teaching these precepts, most of the time he did not teach them in the way that we usually chant them these days, that it says, I refrain from killing, I refrain from stealing. 
On the contrary, usually he would teach them in a way that balanced the positive and negative aspects of them. So, for example, the, the precept against killing would say, I'll refrain from killing. I will dwell with a heart full of compassion for all living beings. Yeah? So it's not just not killing. Yeah? And say, I will not, instead of, I just won't lie, he said, I will speak what is true, what is good, what is beneficial. I to speak at the right time. Speak on the Dhamma and the Vinaya. I will speak words that go to the heart. Words that are dear and pleasing to many people. Words that will reconcile those who are divided. Yeah? And so this is the right speech. Yeah? Right speech that as a positive act accomplishes something positive. Not just not speaking. So very important to remember because it's always a tendency yeah, that we're sometimes afraid. To, we'd rather not say anything. Yeah? But right speech means actually saying what needs to be said at the right time and in the right way. So the five precepts, again, is a characteristic of the stream enter that they'll keep those five precepts unblemished. Okay? Another characteristic of the stream enter is that they're very generous okay? and that they're not stained, it says stained with stinginess and meanness. So uh, there's even like there's even vinya rules in the, uh, uh, in the vinya. There's, there's, there's a rule that says that uh, you can have what they call a seka samata, which is for a stream enterer who the sangha has made a ruling about their house that they shouldn't go for alms to their house, okay? Because they, they know that they don't have enough money and that they've been giving everything away to the sangha. So they're too generous. And so the sangha actually says, no, no, we're not going to go there because you've got to have enough to feed your family and everything, yeah? So this is a specific rule. So this is, this is the generosity of the stream enterer that they would really just give, give anything, and you know you can see this is not a um, not a, 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 you know that quality of, of generosity and giving is is something we can see around us. There are people who are like that, you know, and there are great examples in the Buddhist community today of people who practice generosity on a on a very uh, 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 wonderful scale. And you know, I'll just give one example of that. Uh, is uh, Paget from the Buddhist Library, who gives away, I think, his entire income in charity, okay, and uh, and as you know, does that wonderful work for helping the the, the children in Cambodia and and many other charity works he does as well, uh, and being very quiet about it, not making a fuss about it. So I hope he's not embarrassed that I'm mentioning this <laughs> to you all, but he's really setting a, a fantastic example of somebody who's really living. Uh, with a heart of great generosity for many people and genuinely benefiting many people. So, uh, so these are some of the qualities of a stream enterer. Now, uh, another thing that's mentioned for a stream enterer is there's another set of five qualities that mentioned. Sila, Sutta, Sakacha, Samatha, Vipassana. Sila is, is uh, ethics, which we've already talked about. Sutta means the it literally means listening. And it means, of course, learning the Dhamma. Because in, in the Buddha's day, it was all oral teachings. Yeah? So what you're doing now, listening. Absorbing the Dhamma. And that's also a very important characteristic of the stream entra. So there's, there's this um, obligation or necessity to actually really try to learn and study and understand the Dhamma and understand the teachings. And uh, uh, you know, if there's one case where the where the uh, lay people group of lay people came to the Buddha and said, "Lord, you know, tell us what we should what we need to do to to, to deepen our practice." And he says, "Oh, you should study the Brahmajala Sutta." So any of you who know the Brahmajala Sutta, the first sutta of the Diga Nikaya, is one of the most longest and most complex and difficult philosophical suttas in the whole canon, right? And these lay people and the Buddha says, you should study the Brahmajala Suttas. And they say, oh, come on, that's, we can't do the Brahmajala Sutta. Give us something easier to do. And he's saying, well, you know, if you're not really going to do it, what can you expect? So this is something that's also uh, very um, important. Spend some time listening to Dhamma, reading Dhamma books, studying the suttas. And it's not so much, you know, you don't have to become the world's greatest scholar. You don't have to learn everything. You don't have to spend your life learning Pali grammar or anything like that, but to take an interest to really know what is it that the Buddha taught, yeah? to really understand that, remembering that one of the knowledges or one of the aspects of a stream enterer is to be able to let go of wrong views. Yeah? 
And this is how one of the ways we let go of wrong views. We learn the Dhamma. We learn, you know, I was in last night giving a talk at the Buddhist Society in, in Adelaide, and, and uh, like one of the questions which came up was about, I mentioned it a little bit earlier tonight, but about the, this apparent prophecy of, of the, that the world's going to end in 2012, according to the Mayan calendar or something like that, and people seem to be very concerned about this. And, uh, and, and so this one person was quite kind of stuck on this whole kind of thing, and I, and I said, you know, so well, I said, well, I'll, 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 maybe you know, we can't resolve this issue now, so I'll, talk, I'll wait till the day afterwards and we can talk about it then. Yeah? <laughs> and she said, well, maybe it won't be a, an actual destruction, but maybe it's more like a psychic thing or an emotional thing. And I said, yeah, maybe, or maybe it's just complete nonsense and doesn't mean anything at all. Yeah? So this is wrong view. Yeah? The, the view that things are de the world destined to end on a certain day is wrong view. Okay? The world is not destined to end on a certain day, and anyone who believes that is a fool, frankly. Right? We've had, <laughs> but lots of people. We want we want to believe in these things. You know, we want to believe in astrology, or we want to believe in palm reading, or something like that. And none of these things are important, you know. And uh, of course, you should know the the, the great story of Ajahn Chah, because because um, when. Um, uh, when when Ajahn, one of the fellows who used to do a lot of work for the Ajahn Chah's monastery. And, um, and uh, he kept on pestering Ajahn Chah. So he said, can you read my hand, read my palm? Yeah? And Ajahn Chah said, ah, so I'm not going to... Uh, he kept on pestering him again and again. He said, okay, okay. He said, okay, I'll read your palm. So he comes up puts his palm there, looks at his palm. And he says, ooh, look at that. Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh. <gasps> Oh, we, we won't talk about that, but oh, no. The guy said, tell me, tell me, what is it? He said, oh, look at that one. Tell me, tell me, what is it? He says, well, he says, yes, yes, yes. He says, mm. he says your future, he says, yes, yes, yes. He says, he's uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's wisdom, isn't it, yeah? So what are we going to do? Read palms and all of these kinds of rubbish. Save your money. You know, so it's, it's kind of curious. We're kind of reflecting on this today, like why we, we feel the need to believe in these kinds of things. There's so many genuine problems. If we want to worry about the world ending, there's plenty of ways the world can end without worrying about Mayan calendars, for goodness sake. You know, we can worry about global warming or nuclear devastation or... You know, anything like that. There can be plenty of ways to end the world without invoking the poor old minds. So this is these are some of the kind of wrong views which which you know we have in our mind, which can affect us and they affect how we relate to the world, the choices that we make, and these things. And these are the kinds of things which we can dispel through reading the Dharma, learning about it, and reflecting on it. And so this uh, this is quite important. And one of the, the aspects of Sutta of listening to the Dharma. Uh, and the Buddha said, it's an interesting passage, the Buddha said that uh, you cannot comprehend the Dhamma if you listen to it, where he says, with uparambhachitta, which with a, with a fault-finding mind. Okay? Randhagavesi, looking, looking to find things wrong with it. Okay? So if you're listening to the teaching, listening to the Dhamma, with a critical fault-finding mind, then you can never really understand it. Okay? And that, of course, relates to that aspect of faith that we were talking about before. That one has, a, one has, a, one has a, gives one's heart to the Dhamma. Of course, it doesn't mean you can't inquire, right? It doesn't mean you can't, you know, find, discern what's right and what's wrong. But it means it's that critical attitude, yeah, of trying to find fault, yeah, rather than there's an attitude of trying to find the truth, which is different from trying to find fault, yeah. So there's two different attitudes. So this listening to the Dhamma, next factor is sakacha, is uh, discussion. Yeah? And it's also very important. We clarify our views, clarify our ideas. And that's very important that we have a group of people that we can do that with. Yeah? And, you know, when, when uh, you know, if you, like I, I do travel around quite a bit and meet different Buddhists in different contexts, and you see that it's quite common for people, especially in a world like we have today where the Buddhist community is very fragmented, it's quite common to meet somebody who really has never spoken to or other Buddhists or has spoken to other people about meditation and Dhamma and so on. 
and then they can get very, very strange ideas or very lost or very confused about something in meditation, which a confusion which could have been cleared up very easily uh, just by having a few friends and just sitting around having a coffee and saying, talking about meditation and stuff. Yeah? So don't uh, underestimate that. This is one of those factors leading to stream entry is discussion, especially discussion about the Dhamma. So please don't neglect that yeah? and don't, don't think that that's... Um, trivial. Yeah? Your ability to have friends uh, whom you can share the Dhamma with is, is very, very precious and very important. And then the last two, uh, Samatha Vipassana, is, is uh, tranquility, practice of uh, breath meditation, metta and so on, and Vipassana, okay, insight meditation, seeing directly into the nature of reality as impermanent, conditioned, and not suffering and not self. So important to notice that these days, modern times, some people focus only on the vipassana, right? So you do these retreats where you just do vipassana and then you get stream entry at the end of it, yeah? And that's not what the Buddha said, all right? So all of the things I've been talking about today, yeah? Siddha, Sutta, Sakata, Samatha, Vipassana, all of those other things, that's all part of it. It's a balanced development, a holistic development, not just one thing, not just vipassana. Vipassana is the crowning glory of Buddhist practice. Yeah, it's the higher, it's the, it's the, it's the, the kind of the elite practice, the high level practice of penetration to the truth. But it stands on this whole foundation of development, one in oneself and in the community. And the 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 core of that 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 seeing of vipassana is very often said to be the understanding of dependent origination. Okay. So the stream enterer sees and understands dependent origination. So I'm not going to talk about dependent origination in detail here, but just to, to remark that that is uh, something that's very important that we should take an interest in. So we shouldn't just kind of dismiss it and say, oh, well, that's for the, I'll worry about that when I'm an arahant or something like that. Yeah? It's something we should try to understand. Yeah? And you know, the, 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 some of the, the key principles to dependent origination, you know, understanding the uh, conditioned nature of our mind and of our body yeah? and to be able to, to in continually investigate and reflect on that is uh, a, a, a crucial part of this. And so with all of these factors developed in the stream enter abandons um, what they call, uh, they usually translate as attachment to rites and rituals. Okay. Uh, sila Pata Paramasa. Attachment to rites and rituals is a fairly bad translation. It's actually sila, meaning precepts or ethics or external observances, and vata is, is vows. Okay? So what that means basically is attaching or getting attached to or misapprehending the external aspects of religious and spiritual practice. Okay? That's really what, it, what it's getting at. Okay? So thinking by taking up a vow by doing a, a, a ritual, by keeping some kind of rule or something like that, that you can attain enlightenment. But the Buddha also said you can't get enlightened without these things. Okay? So he's not saying that these things are bad in themselves, but just that one needs to not misapprehend them. So it's used this word paramasa, which means to misapprehend it. It means thinking that that's the essence, that that's the end of spiritual practice. Actually, it's the beginning of it. Yeah? So one abandons that. Uh, and one abandons um, attachment to views and opinions. So, you know, not these, these kinds of ideas I was mentioning before, thinking that, you know, we're all going to be get sucked up to heaven by an alien, passing alien spaceship or something like that. And the um, attachment to a, a doctrines of self. So for a stream enterer, they haven't completely let go of a sense of identity. Okay? So they still feel like a person. Okay, but they don't. They wouldn't consciously um, theorize and have opinions that they are something or other in particular. Okay, there's still like a smell of identity and self hanging around, an aroma hanging around, but the but the but the sort of concreteness of it, the 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 the, the theoretical attachment to I am this self or I am that, and I I am a, a Buddhist, I am a monk, I am a man, I'm a woman, all of these kinds of sense of identity as something, those things are all let go of, so that there's a very kind of uh, gracious emptiness and flow, uh, and so the stream enterer because they're not attached to any particular way of being something or other, 
is very spontaneous and able to live in the moment. And they, instead of being an idea of what they think they should be, they just are who they are. Yeah? And so this is a great quality you see of, of, of advanced practitioners, is that they are very much themselves. And uh, they're very unapologetic about that. So this is uh, just a, a, a short talk this evening on stream entry, what stream entry means, why it's important, why we should be interested in it, how to practice those particular qualities of practice that we need to develop to attain stream entry, uh, and how that helps us to let go of suffering. So I offer that to you this evening for your um, uh, reflection.